time for the kids to come forward. Kids, come on up. Well, Roxy, I think she's a little bit too young. But if you want to bring her, she's okay. You're good. All right. Come on up. Come on in and have a seat. All right. Good to see you. All right. Have a seat. Have a seat right over here. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Shh. All right. Let's listen. Let's listen. It is so good to see all of you here. We missed you last couple weeks. We were away, but we're back now, and we're starting the season of Lent today. And the season of Lent is a preparation to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. And so we got to spend the next few weeks thinking about how it is that Jesus came to this earth to die on a cross, only to come back to life on Easter Sunday. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to start from the very beginning of the story of the gospel, way back in the Garden of Eden, where we're going to meet a character named the Serpent. Do you guys know what a serpent is? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. What's a serpent? A snake. And why are people often afraid of snakes? What do you think? I, I'm afraid of snakes. Why are, why are people afraid of snakes? Because they can bite you. Guess what I have in this bag? What do you think? What do you think? Lunch. No. No. Any other guess? Oh, man. Any, what do you think in there? Snakes, oh, here they go. Are they real snakes? No, they're I not. Snakes. Well, we're not going to have your mom come up here then, are we? <laughs> All right. So, these, well, these are not real snakes. Snakes are very dangerous because, as you can see, sometimes when they bite you, they may be poisonous and you can get really sick and, and, and even die. And so, snakes sometimes can be a problem. And that reminded me of when Marie and I bought our first house outside of Chicago. It was a real fixer-upper, let's just politely say that. And we had lots of things to do, especially in the yard. The previous owner kind of let things go a little bit wild. And one of the things we noticed is in the back patio, there was sort of a wall made of decorative cinder blocks. And it looked like that. Really nice. And it kind of, in our backyard, there was a nice concrete porch with this wall, this low hanging wall. And when we took possession of the house, I was surprised to see that there was a tarp hanging over the wall that looked like that. I, again, didn't think anything of it until I lifted up the tarp and there was like 30 snakes slithering all over the place. But then they went away and I didn't think anything of it. But then I was talking to some friends the next day at church and they said, look, dude, if you don't take care of those snakes in the winter, they're going to burrow into your house and make a nest. So I did what any manly man would do. I decided to smoke them out. And so what I did is I took some lighter fluid. Kids, don't try this at home. But I sprayed it in all the different nooks and crannies of the patio. And with my trusty machete in one hand, and this is the actual machete that I use. Don't really touch it, right? Because this is dangerous. Do not touch. So we're gonna pretend that this is my real life machete. So with my machete in one hand and a lighter in the other, I carefully lay down, and as soon as I lit the fire, hundreds of garter snakes came out. Can we see the picture? And so I took my machete and I started to chop their heads off with the machete. And Benjamin was a little boy, and he's like, Look out, Dad, he's gonna get your feet. So I'm jumping all over the place over here. True story. I don't know how many snakes I vanquished that day. But from that point forward, I no longer had a snake problem. Now, what we're going to find out in today's passage is that Adam and Eve also had a snake problem. And the serpent, the serpent, yeah, we'll get there. The serpent tempted, tempted Adam and Eve to do something naughty and to do something that they weren't supposed to do. But even though Adam and Eve made a mistake, and even though they fell into temptation, in the midst of God's Word, we're going to see that He made a promise that one day someone would come that would crush the head of the serpent. So good job listening, guys. You can take a piece of candy before you return to your seats. If you are preschool through first grade, you can head to rest stop with your parents' permission. Good job, guys. So while the kids are getting settled, please open up your Bibles to the very first book, the book of Genesis. That's where we're going to be this morning. 
So in the name of this series, this name of all names, today's message is about the seed or the offspring of the woman we see referred to in the book of Genesis. And to help us out in our study, if you can see the next slide please, John. One of the books Maria and I picked up at our conference, a wonderful book called Name Above All Names, by two of the presenters we heard from, Pastors Alistair Beck and Sinclair Ferguson. Both of these gentlemen are originally from Scotland. We learned a tremendous from. So we thought we'd pick up this book and use this as our guide through the Lent season. And I really love the season of Lent. Not only because we get to talk about who Jesus is, but also because of the simple fact that the season of Lent reminds us, even though if you look outside, the snow's piling up, it reminds us that spring is almost... How many of you are sick of winter? Yeah, me too. And so we recognize during this Lent season, as we begin this journey together today, even though there's still quite a bit of snow outside, that the Lent season is all about new life, specifically the new life we find in Jesus Christ. And so this particular passage, we're going to skip the first and second chapter of Genesis where God created this beautiful earth, but he basically made a promise to Adam and Eve. He said, look guys, I want you to live with me forever in this garden. And it's going to be great. And you're going to be tending this garden. I want you to expand the borders of this garden to the ends of the earth. And you can hang out with me forever. And it's going to be great. But as we're going to see, there was one rule. There was one kind of glitch in the whole process. That God said, you can eat from any tree. But there was this one tree in the center of the garden. Where God said it was very dangerous. That you shouldn't even touch it. For if you eat from that fruit, you will surely die. And it's in that context that we meet this character, the serpent. But even though this is a very depressing passage, at the very end of it, we see something unusual. We see a promise that's known as the Proto-Evangelion. That's a fancy word for describing the first announcement of the good news of the gospel. This passage gives us the first hint of the gospel. Satan delivers a crippling blow to the seed of the woman, who we're going to find out is Jesus. But then, who in turn delivers a fatal blow, squish, to the serpent, first defeating Satan through Jesus' death and his resurrection, and then by destroying Satan in the final judgment. So keep that in mind as we begin our Lent series together, talking about the very first hint of the gospel of Jesus Christ, starting with chapter 3, verse 1. Here we go. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but, but God did say, yeah, He did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not even touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman looked and saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some, she ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. But then, at that moment, the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were naked. So, they sewed fig leaves together, made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. But they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord called out to the man saying, hey, where are you? He answered, well, I, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid he said, well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from that tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, well, uh, the woman that you put in here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, uh, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God turned to the serpent and said, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all the livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust on the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring. 
and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So this beautiful, picturesque, perfect garden that Adam and Eve could have potentially lived forever, enjoying God's presence, enjoying spreading out the boundaries of the Garden of Eden so that the whole world was this beautiful garden, had one little rule to follow. And that was not to go anywhere near this tree. Don't even touch the fruit of that tree. Because if you do, something bad is going to happen. And we see in this beautiful creation that Adam and Eve found that they had a snake problem. And that snake problem was the serpent. And so scholars don't necessarily agree whether or not it was Satan who took the form of the serpent. But we see clearly from this passage and others that refer to it that standing behind this crafty serpent was the prince of darkness, Satan himself. And so Satan used one of his all-time favorite tricks to destroy humanity, to turn them away from God. He took what God's word says and he twists it. And so he goes up to this woman saying, come on, Eve. Did God really say you must not eat from the... Did he really? Did, are you sure? Did you hear it right? The woman says to the serpent, Well, we may eat from the tree of the knowledge, but God did say, You must not. Don't do it in the middle of the garden. You must not even touch it or you'll die. And the serpent once again twisting, You will not surely die. Eve, come on now. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And here it is. You will be like God. The root of all the sin in the human heart is they forget their place. They forget that they're the creature. You have a creator that has created us to live in a certain way. And you just say, no, 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 I want to be like God. And then, of course, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree that was good and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, we see what happened. But as we look at this book, I think a helpful quote in here. Can you see that, John? We see that, of course, Eve tried to argue with the serpent, but she failed and was eventually drawn into his scheme. She assessed the significance of the tree through her eyes rather than through her ears. Instead of listening to what God has said about it, she thought about it only in terms of what she could see on it. After all, it looked delicious as well as detractive. She had not grasped the divine principle. Believers, you and I, we see with their ears, not with their eyes, by listening to God's word. And so sadly, Eve fell into temptation. She took from that tree and she ate it. Not only that, but she took from the tree and she gave some to her husband. And at that exact moment, all of creation became broken. The desire for disobedience, the destructive forces of sin became part of the DNA, the very cells of Adam and Eve, so much so that their children and their children's children, all the way down to us, this disposition for disobedience, trying to be like God, was passed down all the way even to our generation that we still wrestle with it. And so at that moment, feeling guilt and feeling shame for the first time, they realized that they were naked, sewed filled leaves together and made covering. And when they heard God walking through the garden in the cool of the day, they heard him and they hid. Do you ever try to do that? You know, sometimes I do. Even though we have the creator of the universe who sees and knows all things, we try to hide from him. You can't see me. I'm in a building. We try to do that sometimes, right? We try to hide from God. We try to hide the things that we do. Oh, we close the door. No one is going to see me. So Adam and Eve, hiding from God. God says, well, where are you? Well, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God responds, well, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from that one tree I commanded you not to eat from? And at this point, God is giving Adam and Eve a chance to fess up, right? You can remember parents sometimes when you catch your kids doing something naughty. Parents want to see, they know what you did, don't even think about it. They know what you did, but they want to see if you're going to be honest and take responsibility saying, yeah, I, I messed up. So God knows what happened, but asks Adam, and hoping that he will confess his, his mistake and ask for God's forgiveness, it's not what he does. Because at this point in the story, we see that when sin entered into the world, he no longer became aligned with God, 
His allegiance was now with the serpent. And in the same way that the serpent twists the truth, we see Adam say, um, 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 it wasn't my fault. It was the woman. Yeah, that woman, God, that you put in this garden. It's her fault. She gave me the fruit and I ate it. You can imagine God's heart breaking. He knows exactly what happened. And then he turns to Eve, maybe giving Eve an opportunity to, to fess up. Adam couldn't do it. He twisted the truth. Is Eve going to do it? And he goes, uh, uh, it was the serpent's fault. Was it my fault? The serpent did it. Deceived me and I ate it. God didn't ask any questions of the serpent. He knew exactly what happened. He looks directly at the serpent and says, Cursed are you above all animals and livestock and wild animals. So if you ever want to know why people are naturally afraid of snakes, I'm sure God uses snakes like to keep the mice population down. Or I don't know. I'm going to have to ask them. Those are mosquitoes too, right? God, what's the deal with mosquitoes? Come on. But here the snakes are cursed animals. And then he looks at verse, we look at verse 15. And he says to the snake, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Can we see the Hebrew for enmity there? The Hebrew word there is a ball, which literally means hatred, hostility. Humanity is now divided into these two groups. One, the redeemed, those who love God. And second, the other group is the seed of Satan, those who love themselves overall. This is difficult, right? Because we live in a society that is hesitant to ever call good, good, and evil, evil. Why well, are they really evil? They're just misunderstood, right? We hear that all the time. And yet it's clear from God's word that there really are only two sides with clear distinctions of allegiance for each one. And so you and I, we live in the conflict today that started back in the garden because there's only these two groups. But then at the end of this curse, we see a promise. The promise is that the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman, will crush your head, right? So let's just say it's not, Christine, it's not real, right? Let's just say that this snake was real, okay? And I walked into church one day and there's a cobra right in here. How would I go about destroying it if I didn't have my trusty machete on me at all times, right? It's illegal, don't do it. But let's say I see this cobra, how silly would I be if I went, I'm gonna step on his tail. No, it's the head of the snake that's the most dangerous. And so God promises that down the road, an offspring, a seed of the woman, will come and crush the head of the serpent. But when that happens, the other side of the promise that in, the, in that event, the snake is going to bite, bruise, wound, strike, his heel. Because people that lived in Old Testament times that read this book for the first time after God gave it to Moses and shared it with the Israelites, they had to deal with snakes all the time. And so they recognized that when you see a poisonous snake, you don't mess with it. And if you are unlikely enough to get bit by a poisonous snake, not only does it hurt terribly, but there's a good chance you're gonna die. And so we see in this statement, this promise, this great wonder of what is to come. And even though everything's messed up and broken, God comes and says, no, 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 I'm going to promise that one day someone's going to come and fix it. And of course, we know that person is Jesus. We know that you and I, we live on this side of the cross and this side of the empty tomb. We know that the war is already won, but we still live in the midst of this battle. So as we look back at another quote from the book, we put that up there and ask the question, and this is the question I want you to wrestle with. How does Jesus crush the head of the serpent and destroy his influence? Where Adam conceded victory to Satan, Jesus resisted him. Total obedience to his father marked the whole course of his life. Remember, remember the temptation in the wilderness? Three years after that, Jesus was brought to a tree. He too faced temptation, but in his case, the temptation was to not eat of its poisonous fruit. The obedient last Adam reversed the disobedience of the first Adam. When the second man, he was brought to Calvary's tree, it was an accursed tree. 
Jesus willed to take the divine curse, although everything in him, every holy desire, longed for and deserved the divine blessing. He took our place. He bore the curse, all for love's sake. So in closing, I want you to think back to that story with the kids that I shared. And it is a true story. And this is the actual machete that I used to crush the head of all of those serpents that day outside of Chicago. I do not advise walking around with a machete. Okay? You will get picked up by the police and thrown in jail. I'll come visit you, but don't make me visit you in jail. But when you look at this machete... Do you notice it only has an edge on one side of it? God has given us a weapon, even more powerful. In fact, the best weapon ever created to defeat the forces of darkness and to stand up to the seat of the serpent. And of course, that weapon is God's word, called a double-edged sword. As we see in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living active, and yes, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. God has promised us in His Word to send a Savior, to bring the good news of the Gospel. And so we see that the heart of the Gospel is this. In demonstration of His love, the Heavenly Father sent His only Son to die on a tree, on a cross, in our place, and for our sins. As we see from the book of Romans, God demonstrates His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were still part of that whole seed of Satan camp, Christ died for us. That is the truth we stand on. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for Your Word. And even though this is a difficult passage to understand and, and to recognize what happened in the garden with our first parents and how that disease, that brokenness got passed down even today that we wrestle with, Lord, help us to see the distinctions between good and evil by looking at your word. Help us to see where our allegiance truly lies. And when we come to realize who you created us to be, help us to stand firmly in the camp of the Savior. And during this Lent season, help us to not be afraid when evil rears its ugly head, allow us to use your word, the double-edged sword, to vanquish all of the enemies of your church and of your Savior, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray.